Hello. 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 Welcome to the Spring 2015 Honors Symposium. We are in our third year of our honors program here at DCB. It grew out of the idea that we wanted to put together some more courses that would work to serve our students who are higher achieving. And so we came up with some classes that we thought would work well and the instructors who, who teach those classes um, run a separate section of the course where the students who enroll in the honors section of the class take on a special project, something specific that just the honors students are doing. And so tonight, they will be presenting those projects. And so if you look at the program, you see we have three groups who are going to be uh, presenting this evening. The first group is um, the group from Abnormal Psychology. I'm not much of a group, it's Haley. Um, but if Dr. Lexi Kavasnika gates would come up and give us an overview of the project, and then Haley can do her presentation. Oh, camera's okay. broken. So Haley is my, my lone <coughs> honors student, but she has been in um, the honors section for Intro to Psychology as well. And in Abnormal Psychology, what we do is we uh, use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is this huge book that uh, we use in psychology to diagnose people with different mental illnesses. And so Haley's task this semester was to read three books and watch three movies and diagnose the individuals from those books and in those movies with a psychological disorder. So she is showing that today. So diagnosing individuals with mental disorders and application in the use of the DSM-5. Haley Maswell. Like Dr. Page, you said, for Honors of Normal Psychology, I've read three books, three movies, and I'll just get started. The Pact was the first book I read by Joey Picoult. Uh, it's flashbacks between then and now in the course of a relationship between two teenagers. Chris and Emily grew up together and eventually began dating. As seniors in high school, everyone expects them to get married and be together for the rest of their lives. Emily was sexually abused when she was a child and she never told anyone and she struggled with the guilt and oppression this caused. After becoming pregnant in her senior year, she decides to commit suicide. She and Chris agree to have a suicide pact. And the flashbacks are then between them. Them growing up, starting very, very young, like five years old and progressing and now, which is the murder. Emily, I diagnosed her with a major depressive disorder. I listed six of the nine criteria in the DSM that Emily meets. It says to meet five symptoms during a two-week period, she met them for much longer than that. Depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, feels sad, empty, hopeless. She feels especially hopeless. Uh, she speaks to Chris about always being sad and depressed, but she feels hopeless because she doesn't think that there's anything she can do to help herself. Markedly diminished interest or pleasure. She loses interest in nearly everything. She still forces herself to get up and go to school, but her heart isn't in it, and the only thing she still connects with is her artwork. Fatigue or loss of energy. She speaks of always being tired, exhausted, and it makes her unwilling to participate. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt nearly every day. Like I said, she was sexually abused and she feels really, really guilty about it. She feels guilty about it having happened and guilty about being impure. Diminished inability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. Uh, she's a senior in high school and she's looking at the rest of her life and she really is struggling with trying to figure out what to do or make decisions, and her current thoughts of death. Like I said, they have a suicide pact. She begins thinking about that really early on, and um, it's once she becomes pregnant, she really wants to commit suicide, and eventually she does succeed, and that's when Chris doesn't help her, and the murder trial starts. 
High on Arrival was the next book I read. Uh, it was a memoir by Mackenzie Phillips, or Laura Mackenzie Phillips. She was the, or is, the oldest daughter of John Phillips, of the Mamas and the Papas. She's famous for her roles in uh, the 70s sitcom One Day at a Time and American Graffiti. She also did work for Disney when she became sober. She used everything from marijuana to black tar heroin and was in and out of rehab a multitude of times. Her memoir discusses growing up as the daughter of John Phillips, her alcoholic mother, drugs, alcohol, various sexual encounters, relationships, her professional life, and trying to raise her son, Jane, as a drug addict. <laughs> if I diagnosed her with everything she had, we'd be here for 20 minutes just talking about her, so I chose just one to focus on. <laughs> and that's opioid use disorder, which is a problematic pattern of opioid use manifested by at least two of the following occurring within a year. I listed all of them, she met all of them. Opioids taken in a larger amount over a longer period of time than intended. Uh, the first time she used illicit drugs, she was 10 years old, and she probably didn't intend to become a full-blown addict for the rest of her life at that time. A great deal of time is spent to obtain the opioid. Uh, throughout the book, she floats in and out of addiction. Depending on where she is, she focuses solely on obtaining the drugs. At one point, she moves her dealers into her house so she can have a constant, constant supply, but she also says they're her friends, so. Her current use results in failure to fulfill major role obligations. Uh, she got fired twice from one day at a time. She can't. She has multiple failed relationships. I think three marriages that end because of her use. Continued use after having persistent recurrent social problems caused by the use of the opioid. Like I said, she loses her job. She loses friends. Uh, she can't perform it for anything. important social, occupational, or recreational activities given up. She loses her job, gives up on finding a new one. Sometimes she just buys insane amounts of drugs and holds herself up and shoots up for days at a time. Recurrent use in situations where it's physically dangerous. At one point, she overdoses and has enough drugs in her system to kill like three people. And she knows this. She knows that she's using way too much. She knows that it's going to kill her, but she keeps using. Continued use despite knowledge of psychological or physical problem caused or exacerbated by the substance. Mackenzie absolutely knows that she's messed up. She knows she could easily die, especially when she's using different types of drugs at the same time. There was a long time where she used cocaine and black tar heroin at the same time. She talks about how she was fully willing to die as a junkie. She had no desire to get better. And then tolerance and withdrawal. She also meets the criteria for opioid um, intoxication and opioid withdrawal, but more than we're gonna get into. Still Alice by Lisa Genova. Uh, Alice is a Harvard professor of psychology who gives lectures all across the country. Her husband is also a successful professor, and they're happily married with three adult children. Alice starts to slowly forget things and eventually is diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. The novel follows her struggle in dealing with the diagnosis and later dealing with losing herself. Major neurocognitive disorder due to Alzheimer's disease. Evidence of significant cognitive decline from a previous level of performance based on concern from the individual or a knowledgeable informant or clinician. Uh, Alice, with her psychological background, recognizes probably sooner than a lot of people would the memory problems. And she kind of suspects that it might have been menopause because she's 50 years old. But when she goes in, they rule out that what she's experiencing is from menopause. And they, uh, give her a full workup and they don't come back with anything so she goes to see a neurologist. A substantial impairment in cognitive performance, preferably documented by a neuropsychological testing or another quantified clinician assistant. Uh, 
Her, as her disease progresses, there's no doubt that Alice has a neurocognitive disorder. She goes to give lectures in her classes and can't remember te technical terms. Uh, she can't remember what she went over an hour before her lifts. At one point, she goes out for a run and completely forgets where she lives. The onset is subtle with gradual progression, <coughs> causing impairment in two or more buildings. <coughs> the DSM actually uses the term insidious, which means gradual or subtle with harmful effects. And everyone misplaces their keys or occasionally forgets to send an email, and that's exactly how everything started with Alice. But it progressed to something much bigger than that, where she completely forgets who she is. And then the DSM says you can have probable Alzheimer's disease or possible. You can diagnose one or the other. And Alice was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease because of genetic testing. She tested positive for the Presendolin 1 mutation, which also uh, might have been passed on to her children. The first movie I watched was Sybil. Uh, Sybil's a young single woman who wants to become a teacher. She is incredibly introverted and lives in New York. She begins to lose time frequently. She'll snap back into reality in places or situations she doesn't know how she got into. Eventually she begins seeing a psychiatrist, Dr. Gilbert, who becomes acquainted with Sybil and recognizes that she has multiple personalities. Together they work in effort to find the origin of Sybil's disorder and uncover the abuse from her childhood. Sybil is diagnosed with multiple personality disorder, which is now called DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. Uh, it's characterized by a disruption of identity, characterized by two or more distinct personality states, marked by discontinuity and sense of self, accompanied by alterations in affect, behavior, consciousness, memory, perception, and cognition. Sybil has 16 alters, both male and female, with 16 very different personalities. Their ages range from baby and onward. One of them speaks French, one can play the piano, and Sybil can't do either of these things. Her current gaps in the recall of everyday events or information. Sybil says she's always had gaps in her memory, uh, at one point, she's talking with her psychiatrist and says that she woke up one day and lost a full year of her childhood. She doesn't remember a thing. And um, when we enter her life in the movie, she's experiencing gaps really frequently, almost every day, anytime she encounters a trigger or specific situation to set her up. Causes significant distress in social or occupational functioning. Sybil's incredibly introverted. I don't think she has a single friend. Uh, she actually loses her job because she's unable to perform as a teacher with her multiple personalities. Uh, in the movie, she does start dating someone, but as you might guess, it's hard to be with someone who has dissociative identity disorder. And the disturbance is not a normal part of a broadly accepted cultural or, or religious practice. Uh, Sybil's culture is a little almost the same as our own, and DID is not really an accepted thing. One of the things I found most interesting about this movie was the interrelationships between her alters. Sybil wasn't aware of any of them, but some of her alters, like 13-year-old Vicky, knew all of the other alters and what they were doing. This is called a one-way amnesic relationship, where some personalities are aware of others. Beautiful Mind. John Forbes Nash is a brilliant mathematician who made an important mathematical discovery early on in his career, actually when he was in college, and he gets an appointment at MIT. Years later, he is asked to help out with cracking Soviet codes at the Pentagon, and later the Department of Defense. At the same time, he falls in love with a student, and eventually they get married. As time progresses, John acts more and more peculiar, as his wife suspects it's not just his job. It turns out that the entire government job was made up, and John had developed paranoid schizophrenia back in college. After receiving treatment, he does teach again and eventually receives a Nobel Prize. He's diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, two or more of the following present for a significant portion of time over a one-month period.
delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and negative symptoms. John experiences three out of the five here. Uh, delusions, he believes that the Soviets are putting messages in newspapers and magazines and he becomes frantic and obsessed with examining them to crack the codes. Hallucinations, he hallucinates three primary characters. Uh, one is his best friend in college, and another one is the director of the Department of Defense who convinces him that they need him for this job. And then the negative symptoms. The older he gets and the more invested he becomes in his code cracking, the more withdrawn and cold he becomes towards everyone else. He was mostly introverted to begin with, but he starts to reject everyone and becomes absolutely engrossed with consuming these magazines to crack the code. Level of functioning is below normal expected levels. Uh, like I said, he was uh, really introverted, and as he becomes more enveloped in his work, he becomes a horrible husband. He doesn't show up to the classes he's supposed to teach at MIT, and he loses himself because he's so frantic about finding patterns and codes. And continuous signs of disturbance persist for six months. Like I mentioned, uh, he hallucinated his college roommate, so that's when at least what we're led to believe was the beginning of his schizophrenia. And Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin, in part thanks to the dedication of her mother, is a highly functioning autistic individual. She has an affinity for mechanical things and struggles with the social aspects of life. She works to overcome controversy in both the school, public, and professional worlds. Temple pursues a degree in animal husbandry and invents a revolutionary method for corralling cattle. She is also an advocate for autistic individuals. She has autism spectrum disorder, which is characterized by persistent deficits in social communication and interaction as manifested by the following. Deficits in social and emotional reciprocity. Uh, she fails in normal back and forth conversations. She never really understands the workings of the conversation. Like, if someone were to say to her, hi Temple, how are you? She wouldn't understand that it would be polite to say, oh, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? She would say, I'm fine, and walk away. Deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction. Uh, she discusses in multiple scenes throughout the movie how she doesn't understand eye contact, and it really bothers her because she knows eye contact means something, but she can't understand what it means. Deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. She had a lot of trouble bonding with anyone, especially, well, even her mom. She makes one friend throughout the movie, really, which is her college roommate, who is uh, blind. Restricted, repetitive behavior, patterns of behavior, interests, or activities as manifested by the following. Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech. Uh, Temple talks repetitively. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, or ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behavior. Temple really, really struggles with change. Uh, even the smallest changes or transitions. She hates change, and new situations make her uncomfortable. Probably like 80 fold what they would make you or I. Highly restricted, fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. She's very, very, very interested in mechanical things like engineering. She can build something amazing, but she hates English. Uh, she goes to stay at her aunt's farm or ranch in her teens, and that's when she develops a love for animal husbandry, and that's what she does pursue later on. Hyper or hypo reactivity to, or to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. As a child, she's really fixated on light. Uh, if she's in a loud situation, like around a bunch of people, it makes her very uncomfortable and she gets overwhelmed. She doesn't deal well with physical contact. Uh, she actually invents this hugging device inspired by a shoot used for cattle. 
and she can't touch anyone or have them touch her for a hug, but if she goes into this device and the pressure is applied to her body, she calms down. Symptoms must be present early in the developmental period. She started school and wasn't doing well, and they, the teachers told her mom to just put her in an asylum because she wasn't doing well. Like, the symptoms were present very early on. It took her a very long time to learn how to talk. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. class and I was very privileged to have three really marvelous students uh, working on a, a project where they tested environmental sites on the campus. Um, the students here today to present to you are Amanda Munson, Sheena uh, Ellingson, and Jesse Allison Williams. They're going to talk about what they've done but I, I just want to first of all thank uh, administration here at the school for supporting this program. Honors programs like this lead to openings that you're not going to see in a program that's not an honors type program. Presenting research for the scientific field is one of the most important things you can do. Publication and presentation are very important to the skills for people going on to graduate school and going on to four-year degrees. So uh, these guys are going to present to you and they can prove to you how great they are, but I've been very privileged to be able to work with these students. So uh, how about it, guys? Sheep's blood auger to test for hemolysis. 
We used asymptic technique for all inoculations and then incubated them at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. <coughs> okay, so here's a, a picture, a couple pictures from our um, our project. Uh, the first one on the left, that's a picture of where we incubated our um, otter plates. The middle is um, all of all 48 plates that we all inoculated. And then the picture on the right is just a, a picture of the temperature. It was 37 degrees Celsius in the incubator, which is our um, human body temperature. Okay, so media tests, we use tryptocase soy auger. It tests for general microbial growth and is a non-selective media. It nourishes most aerobic microbes. We use ampicillin auger. It's a beta-lactam antibiotic active against many gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The mode of action is cell wall inhibition. Okay, we also use canamycin auger. It is an aminoglycosidal, bactericidal antibiotic active against gram-negative bacteria, including E. coli, proteus species, serratia, marcesin, and Coxcellia pneumoniae. Its mode of action is inhibition of protein synthesis. And for our last media, we use sheep's blood auger. It's a media used to isolate, isolate fastidious organisms and detect hemolytic activity. This auger can detect streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat, rheumatic fever, and necrotizing <coughs> fasciitis. So here is a picture of uh, sheep's blood auger plates. Um, on the left is the alpha hemolytic um, bacteria. That's a, that's a partial um, hemolysis, which is eating of the blood. Um, beta hemolysis is in the middle, and that is a complete hemo hemolysis. And it shows it is a pathogen. And then the one on the right is a gamma, which shows no hemo hemolysis. And these would be the different types of bacteria. Okay. So microbial growth, these are some examples of what it would look like. So this first picture on the left, that is the streak method that we use to inoculate our plates and to isolate our colonies. As you see in the middle, there's small little, um, small little circles. Those are isolated colonies of the bacteria that we wanted to look at. And this would be that um, inoculation is the first step of the five eyes of microbiology, which include um, inoculation, which is um, getting the samples of these bacteria and putting them onto a, a plate or in a broth or um, on a slant or a mold, uh, gelatin um, auger, which would, which is where you would put them so they could grow. So the next step would be incubation, and that would be. Um, placing them in this incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, which is the body's temperature, and letting them grow for 24 hours. Then the next one would be isolation, which is um, getting these, um, getting them um, by themselves, getting this bacteria by itself to look at it for inspection, which is the next eye. And that is um, doing tests and looking at the bacteria under a microscope. And then the last step would be identified or identification of your bacteria. So finding out if it's E. coli or if it is um, Staphylococcus aureus. And those are the five eyes of microbiology. And this one on the right here is the uh, mold, which would show um, if we had that in one of our samples, that would show contamination. Um, which we did not um, find I'll in our okay. After we inoculated, we had some contaminants and we were looking at it. Yep. <coughs> so it's easy to it's easy to see one of those um, if it's been contaminated. It's it's very specific. That's what we um, all kinds of molds look like. Okay. So our results. Yielded um, antibiotic resistance was located at two sites at 12% of total microbial population. So the sites that we found this antibiotic resistance um, were the water fountain out um, in the weight room and the nurse's office door. And we also found beta hemolysis. We also found beta hemolysis um, at one site, and it was also 12% of the, the 
population we sampled, and that was the water fountain outside the weight room. So that could have been a um, strep throat strain of bacteria that, and we only found it at one site, so that was pretty good. So our conclusions were that, in general, many sites that were tested harbored bacteria. Um, antibiotic resistance seems to be at a low level of 12% of what we sampled, and this may indicate that we are doing a very good job of keeping things clean around here and people are washing their hands. Um, possible beta hemolytic bacterium found at only one site. Again, that's good. Um, and we can dismiss our hypothesis because uh, we found both at high animal traffic areas resistance. Um, so we probably would need to relook at our hypothesis because of the fact that we did do the nursery store. There's, it was a low traffic area, but there was also the fact that the low traffic that does go in there was probably thick. <laughs> Microbes are ubiquitous, meaning that they are everywhere. This means that in the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink. Um, does this mean everyone's going to get sick? No. Most bacteria are part of our microflora, can, which can be found um, in most environmental locations. This can mean like the normal flora we have on our skin flakes off onto all the surfaces, everything we touch, which is probably where we got most of our growth on the plates when we begin it. Um, but that stuff is nothing to be concerned about. Um, the only place where it is excluded is in medical facilities where we use sterile techniques, such as surgical drones and stuff like that. Um, and in our blood and our cerebral spinal fluid and also in our urine, as long as you're a healthy individual, you're not going to have any of that stuff in there.
We will continue to monitor environmental sites on campus and extract DNA and sequence microbes that are resistant. Okay, so this is an, is an example of a Curry, um, Kirby Bauer method of showing resistance and susceptibility of um, bacteria to antibiotics. So in this um, in this uh, slide, you can see that these are little discs that are impregnated with antibiotics, and they're all different types of antibiotics that work in different ways. And you can see this, this is called the zone of inhibition, which is how good that antibiotic works against that ba certain bacteria. So here is a, um, this, there's a tiny little ring around this one, which shows that it has been killed by this antibiotic, but it's not very good, so they would call that uh, assist, um, resistant. This one here is not very good either, they would call that one resistant, and this one as well is resistant to that antibiotic. This one here is a really good antibiotic that works against this bacteria. So, in further research, the, uh, the bacteria that we found uh, resistant bacteria that we found on our slides, this would be the next step in identifying what antibiotic, if it was able to, that an antibiotic worked for it, and we could see like the quantity of, or of how susceptible it is to other antibiotics. So. U.S. History uh, 104 covers a time span from uh, Reconstruction at about 2000. And I will completely agree with Gabber, Mr. Marley's comments in that uh, in the first two years, most undergrad students don't get to dive into some of the major works for the American history. And in my honor sections, you get four. So out of the two dozen or so that are considered to be the base for a college senior that's majoring in history, uh, you can scrape eight by the time you get out of a 103 and 104 session. And uh, with 104, some of my favorites that uh, Ms. Shea forgot to touch on would be probably my favorite band book, The Jungle, and 13 Days by Robert F. Kennedy. So. Um, one thing that Sarah wanted to do for the presentation is local history. Local history is humbling because you can go into any American or world environment and there is a ton of local history that you will have absolutely no grasp on whatsoever. And so it always exposes somebody that thinks that they know something about history. The weaknesses in that it's just this discipline that you can never really fully get a handle on because it's just so diverse. And uh, Ms. Schaefer's going to talk about her region of the world that she grew up in, local history wise. Thank you, Sarah Schaefer. Thank I don't have a map on here. I was so caught up in the project that I don't have a map for where I'm from. But, 
So I'm from Anaconda, Montana, and that's from the southwestern part of Montana. And View is 26 miles east of that, and this is where I grew, grew up. Anaconda, a lot of people think, when I told them when I said I'm from Anaconda, they thought it was bizarre. They got the name because if you look at it from a, um, a bird's eye view, it looks like an anaconda going through the valley. And then a, the view is because of the mountains and the crevices and whatnot. So these pictures here, this is before, during, I wasn't alive during that time, but these times here are when I was alive. Um, I recall it as the richest part of Montana. Anaconda in view today. Today in Anaconda, there's four schools, and according to the Census Bureau in 2013, Anaconda had about 9,000. Today, I'd say about, it's getting down to 4,000, 5,000 about, especially in the town area because there's not as many jobs anymore, and we're a big healthcare part of the state and close to Missoula and Bozeman. And then there's Butte. They have seven schools, about 5,000 enrolled in their schools. In my class, we were the smallest class to graduate from Anaconda High School. There used to be two high schools, uh, Central Anaconda High School and Anaconda High School, the public one. Butte still has a Central one, and the class of mine was 69, and the last class to graduate with 100 was my oldest sister, who's 28, and she graduated with 112. Activities. Of course, Anaconda has more because Anaconda and View has a rivalry. Um, Anaconda, we have the Wayne Nestis basketball tournament. A lot of people all over the world come from everywhere. Even Dano, he played at it. I just found it a couple days ago. Um, the Christmas drill, everyone comes to the streets, to the main streets, and enjoys themselves, drinks hot chocolate. High schooler students, they stand in the windows and act as dummies, and they have a contest of who could act as the best dummy and whatnot. Um, the Goose Town Softball Tournament. It's the biggest slow pitch softball tournament on the western side of the Mississippi. Everyone comes and on Saturday night we have a home run derby and it's a lot of fun. Art in the Park, once again, all around the world people come to see this. Great art, great music, great food. Um, some of my favorite food is the huckleberry ice cream. The huckleberries are picked from Montana hills and mountains. Live After Five, we have that on every Friday in the summertime. Once again, music, nice cars, great uh, food booths and whatnot. And the Polar Plunge, there's a mountain up in the uh, mountain lake and they go jump into the ice cold water and then afterwards they get in hot tubs. View, Evil Knievel Days, those, that's a lot of fun. They watch motorcycle races, car races, whatnot. The Civil Center, Civil Civic Center, they have hockey games here, rodeos, fairs, concerts. St. Patrick's Day, I just put that up there because you and Anaconda reign from Irish descent, and St. Patrick's Day is a bigger day than New Year's Eve for us there. Montana Tech, that's their school there. They're the number one engineering school in the United States. And mining museums, there's a, I believe there's about five of them. And then Lady of the Rockies, there's this big, huge statue of Mary of God, and she stands above view and shines down upon them. And the Berkeley Pit, which is the only place you can view toxic waste in the world, and you only have to pay two dollars to get in to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Founders of Anaconda and View. So miners were looking for gold back in the days, and they came across View, Montana. The cattle farmers were coming, other miners were coming, and whatnot. And in 1860, they found this river flowing through the country side and everything. And they decided to call it Silver Bow because when they were on top of the mountains, the rivers looked like silver. And so they thought, what the heck, this should be an omen, and they started mining there. And they did find a little silver, they found a little gold, but they were kind of striking out. They were starting, settlers were starting to move on. They didn't want to waste their time there, especially if they were going to be mined out. And then they started hitting the ports. That started bringing more people around, they started bringing mills, started building smokestacks and smelters, but they didn't know how to successfully build, build the smokestacks, so they kept on trying, kept on mining and shipping them to different countries and different parts of the states to get them mined. More and more copper started to show, and this is where people started to get excited. Electric 
electricity was just starting to build up. And at the time when, it, when electricity was getting really big and the copper was getting really big, Anaconda in Mon Montana, you had more electricity available in that area than Chicago and New York City at the time. People started to realize there was a profit and then Marcus Daly showed up to change everything. And this is Butte here, that's the M Hill and that's the top of the hill that they saw there. This, yeah. They were at the top of this hill and then over here towards this was the rivers and then over here are the mine areas and starts of Butte. And then right here, that's where Tech is. Marcus Daly and the Copper Kings. He was born in Ireland and didn't come to New York City until 1856. He stayed there, he came around 12, like when he was 12, and he started to realize what he was interested in and the city life wasn't for him. Then he started to go out towards California and Utah and he realized he really liked the mining industry. And he got together with the Walker brothers. He shared some of his ideas with them and they really liked him and he knew what he was talking about. He just had great ideas and great plans of what to do. And then he was sent to Utah and this is where he met his wife and married and he had four kids, and then he was sent to Montana Territory because they needed a lot of help because they were getting hit so hard mining and so many people were going there that needed help to understand how to mine. He went there and he bought the Alice Mine. This was a smaller mine and he wanted to grow from that and he kept one-fifth investment for himself then purchased the Anaconda claim. This was where I'm from in that area there. And with George Hurch, James Ben, Al Allie Hagen, and Lloyd Tevis, they decided to get together and build the claim, build the town, and decided to build the Anaconda claim even bigger. George Hurst, he, our public library was named after him, and James Ben Hagen, that's our tallest mountain, that was named after him. Silver mine at first, then they started to hit the copper very hard. Um, the copper vein about 300 feet deep and 100 feet wide. He got really excited about this, and they had to start finding a place to smell. They started to send all this copper to different places to smelt, but it was just costing so much. So this is when he finally found the idea of building smelters himself. I believe he had four at first, and then they built the biggest one. $17 million worth of copper each year during this time. And then that's Marcus Daly there. This is his mansion in Hamilton, Montana. It's about an hour and a half from where I live, and we had cross-country races here every year. It's beautiful there in the fall. He had an outdoor swimming pool, an outdoor tennis courts, 46 acres of land. He started a ranch cattle um, gardens. He also built play areas for his kids and whatnot. This is the hotel in my town. It's called the Marcus Daly Hotel. And they took about this much off right now. What's left is just this bottom part, and that's where our subway was. But then the people who bought that building, they wanted Subway to move out because they're going to build it up again. And they're going to have it about five stories high again. And then down there is where we have our life after five, and right there is where our Subway was. Butte's Mines. It's known as the richest hill on earth, still is. And when people came to America and they didn't know where to start, if they didn't want to go to the meat packing places or other places, they didn't want to get involved in bad territory or whatnot, they said, don't stop here, don't stop to America, go straight to Butte. Butte was such a different part of, of Montana, such a different part of America, that they just had a culture of their own, especially the Irish and the Italians, the Dutch, some of German. In 1896, five square miles produced 210 million pounds of copper a year, and that's a lot. Um, 26 of the world supply, 51 of the U.S. supply. 1917, a huge disaster happened though. There was a 30-foot elevator shaft and it caught on flame and, and 167 men were killed. And this is where ARCO came and OSHA came and they realized that they needed to do something different because even though they were mining so much of the world supply and the U.S. supply, they couldn't um, sacrifice and risk men's lives anymore. And then Chile's Kwakikamata Qua mine heard of this, of Butte, and they decided to get a little pitch in of it. They started to buy this copper and distribute it all over the world. 
In World War II, they needed a lot of copper, and during this time, even women were starting to mine and working at the smelter because so many men had to go and help fight World War. Um, so during the time, this is by the pit watch, put in another way, the Berkeley Pit and Butte Mines produced enough copper to pave the four lane highway four inches thick from Butte to Salt Lake City and three miles beyond. And then they started having a falling out with Chile's mines. They didn't want to buy it anymore. Other people were finding other mines to mine the copper from. And they could have easily built bigger smokestacks and bigger organizations to distribute the copper. This one is one mile to surface. If they didn't go any further than that because they were going wider than down further. They didn't want any more disasters or any more harm to come to the men. And I really like this picture because I think it would be really hard to get two wheels down underground and for them to pull back up. It, it's weird to think that they got those in the elevator and then lowered them down. <laughs> so those are pretty calm donkeys there. And then these are all the different levels of mines all the way down here, and this is about the mile mark here. All these red, those are the elevator chutes. I counted about 14, I'm not sure, I think half of those are still standing today. And in the winter especially, they light them up with Christmas lights and it's beautiful, especially at night. And then right there, that's the Berkeley pit, and it has different levels right there. And they started going up there, and then these are little organizations kind of, and especially up there, that was its own town. They needed another town because so many people were coming. The Berkeley Pit, several pits throughout the history of time. And the reason they started is, especially during World War II, they were getting, they had to get so much copper and so much of the ore out, they didn't know what to do with it. So they decided just to start building this big pit and just dumping it in there. They needed to put all the ore somewhere. It was mostly ore. Um, it's one mile on by a half a mile across, um, and it's over 1,780 deep in a hundred being acidic water with high concentrations of metal. Copper, iron, arsenic, zinc, cad cadmium, and more. They pump 13 million gallons a day, and what they do is they're doing that because they're still getting copper out of that water, and so they're getting about 400,000 pounds of copper a month. And Right now, it's at a dangerous level. They're about at 3,000, I want to say 4,100. And if it gets about to 5,100, it's going to start overflowing and going into the beach wells. And it's rising a foot per month. So they're trying to think of something quick so it doesn't happen. Uh, another disaster. Here's the Berkeley pit here. <coughs> There's wells here, here, and over here. And as you can see, it's getting very dangerous to that. Over here, this is where they just loaded up the ore and dumped it over. They had to work quick and they needed to work efficiently, so they just started dumping it there. And in 1995, OSHA became, and PETA became very um, suspicious because there was a flock of Canadian snow geese and they landed in there, and there was a major snowstorm, and then the next morning they were all dead. They said that the Berkeley pit wasn't the harm of it and that they just got caught in, but there's suspicion that it was caused. The, all the acidic water and what's in it was what killed the snow geese. And this is the viewing deck that you can go to for the museum. Anaconda smokestack, this is where I reign. Um, I love the smokestack. In 1980, they wanted to tear it down. They thought it would be after something bad happened, but there was an organization that formed together to keep it up to signify what Anaconda went through and how much work they put through to just start a community here. It was completed in 1919, I believe in November, and it's 585 feet tall. To help, the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall, and 75 feet across at the bottom here, and then 60 at the top. And they have a state park where it's a simulation of what the top is, and you can draw. You can probably fit going across this way, I'd say, a lot of cars. And honestly, on the rim up here, you can drive your car around it because it's so thick. And 1980 was shut down, like I said, and they wanted to keep it up. But a mile around, you cannot go in this area here because the ground is so acidic and so bad for you, you have to wear a mask. 
And a lot of the people now, like a lot of people's great grandparents, grandparents, um, they die because they had so much junk and so much acidic stuff in their lungs. And here's how tall it was there. Um, my older friend, my older brother's friend, he, <coughs> he kind of snuck up there and started climbing it, but then they realized that it wasn't going to be a good idea, so they left. <laughs> and then here's a car there to show you how tall it is. And this is our our golf course here and this is the um, one of the shoots for the smokestacks they have four of them but they were just too small and they were not helping at all so they wrecked them down and built this huge one um, this is another picture of when how the mine looked then and just how it was in the mines it was very dangerous there it was kind of funny because during these times one of the reasons the view and anaconda have such a uh, competitive stand between each other is because these these people exactly the miners between the smelter workers they wanted to know who was tough enough the miners or the smelter workers um, there was actually one time where a bus was tipped there was a riot because at a basketball tournament there was so much confusion and so much competitiveness of who was better Butte or Anaconda and one team the Butte team at an Anaconda match I forget what year it was but it was a long time ago they were actually escorted out because the anacondas could not stand everyone. People were spitting and throwing stuff on them, and it's just a huge, huge um, competitive front. And then over here, this is how they got the copper out. They smelted it, and what, what they did is they have slag in the end, and they heat it up so much that they, or the ore comes out and the rest of it starts crystallizing. In Helena they have one, but the slate are big blocks and they heated it up so much that this started to turn to sand. So I'll pass that around. And then that's what this is, is the slate pile. I drive, when I go into town, I drive on this the whole, the whole time. Um, and people want to get rid of it because it's there's kids who's been on it. It causes danger. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that it's ugly. Honestly, I really like it. <laughs> That's just my opinion. I think it symbolizes who, who, what Anaconda was and is. Uh, and you, they're starting to figure out ways to use this slate to use for glass. And we also use it on our golf course for some of the sand pits and some of the traps. And then all this area once it was first started, it was filled with pine trees and trees and everything, and but they all were cut down. And this is where Anaconda comes into the big burn. So that's where it kind of drove me, is because they wanted all these trees and they wanted to go all the way up here and whatnot to cut down those trees to run the smokestack. This is our golf course here. As you can see, those are the sand traps and sand pits. And this is the town right there. The smokestack is over here. This is the big, I forget what they call them, but the bowls that they put the molten copper in and then they dumped it to make the wire and whatnot. And this is the slate pile that I drive by every day. I forget how many tons there is, but there's so much. And there's even some more up towards this area. They just produced too much and they didn't know what to do with it. So they're trying to get rid of it and trying to sell it to places to turn into glass and different types of decorations. And then here comes the 1908 flood. One of the reasons the ground is so acidic is because in 19, I believe, uh, 1907, 1908, it was one of the largest rain seasons ever. In June 6, seven inches of rain, the next, and then the next day it started to snow. The river was about eight feet, but then over a couple of weeks it went up to 17 feet and then it broke the dam and all this stuff it went to the Berkeley pit it went everywhere all into the pits all over to the mines took all the ore and swept it all the way over to Anaconda and so that's why all this is plain right there there's no trees they're trying to rebuild it Arco and OSHA are really trying to um, clean up the area. We've been on a, I've been on a lot of field trips where we go and see what the streams are looking like now. A lot of the life is coming back to it. A lot of the animals and a lot of the bug life are coming back to the streams and whatnot. And a lot of, as you can see here, birds and animals are seen there. You see a lot of deer there now, but early back in the old days, you did not see any because the ground was so bad. 
and they're dumping it over to warm springs ponds and they're trying to distill it and trying to get rid of it as fast as possible, but they have nowhere to put it. And then here's my hometown right here. This is the Marcus Daily Hotel, where it stands. This used to be Subway. That's our one stoplight of traffic. <laughs> um, that's the Sea Hill right there in the fall. The Sea Hill um, symbolizes Central Anaconda High School. And we have a tradition that on the last days that we are seniors, we go up and light them. And it used to be that the juniors went up and light, lit the Sea Hill kind of as a battle. But now the juniors come up and we battle with paintball guns and whatnot. And so that's when Central. I have a friend, um, he's, he, he's a neighbor of ours. He went to Central Anaconda and it was big, but after people started leaving because the smell just shut down, they couldn't keep the town open, so they just left. It was pretty much once you graduated uh, high school, the girls went to college, the guys went to the smelter of the mines. And then this is our Washoe Theater. It's one of the 10 top theaters in the country. It still stands, I believe. 1936 was when it's built. Here's a shirt that I got. It glows in the dark, so you can wear it when you go to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was built in 1936. The 75th anniversary was um, when it was in running was about 2011. Uh, they show great movies. They now just have it put in 3D and a surround sound system. The tickets, I would have to say, it's about seven fifty for a three D movie, six dollars for a regular movie. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy and it's beautiful. The I believe it sits about five hundred. I mean, it fits all the schools and probably some of Buttes too. When we have big movies and everything, we get out for the day. Um, it's really cool. They just redid the lights a couple years ago, so it looks really nice. And in the back, you can see all the posters he's kept through the years. And then here's the A hill. Uh, we climbed that and then lit it. We put a 14 right there and lit it for the night. It was really cool. We just put flares in. This is the M Hill over at Butte, and they have a big, huge 4th of July show. And then this is the smokestack from my house in Butte. And then references and then picture resources. This one at the bottom, the pit watch. If you want to learn any more about uh, the pit or the Berkeley pit, what the mines are up to now, I very recommend that site. I learned a lot from that site, a lot that I didn't know about the Berkeley Pit. I've honestly never been to the museum, but I've seen it before. And I tried to get some pit water, but it was, you have to be pretty high up top to <laughs> get that stuff. So they just don't let the college students come in and get it. So, um, any questions? No? Okay. Which is better, Anaconda or View? Oh, Anaconda. <laughs> Come on. Yes. Is there any special monument or recognition for Evil Knievel in Butte? Yes, there actually is. Um, I forget when he died, but his son comes back every year for us too. It's a huge weekend. Honestly, in the summer of Anaconda and Butte, every single weekend's booked. <coughs> I work at um, a resort. It's called Fairmont Hot Springs Resort. It's a natural hot springs and tourists from all over come. And, and, and during the summer, it's very busy. You find people from France, from Italy, all coming to Evil Can Evil Days, coming for art in the park, coming for all this stuff. So even though it's small, it's starting to become the tourist house that everyone thought it was going to be. You know what? Oh. from my high school yearbook also. Thank you. All right, before I turn it over to Dr. Gross for closing remarks, I just wanted to say that I love Symposium Day, and I think if this is your first time here, you know why. Now it's obvious we've got really, really smart, really talented students here with very varied interests. So thank you to the students who did the extra work um, and did the work to be in the honors program. Thank you to the instructors who taught the courses and who helped the students to choose projects. We certainly appreciate it. And I think it's just a great experience here for our students. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gross.
Thanks, uh, Carrie and uh, Haley and uh, Amanda and, and Jesse and Sheena and Sarah. That's a great work. Thank you very much. Thanks for your effort and, and all your hard work. And also uh, to Ken and, and uh, Alma and uh, Steve and Lexi, thank you for helping these students and for mentoring them and, and for the extra effort that you put in uh, for this uh, what we call value-added honors program. And, and Gary, thanks for coordinating it all and getting it all together. Uh, our uh, goal is to make this program grow and with the collaboration that I've seen between the instructors and, and the students uh, this afternoon, we're well, well on our way. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, one of our uh, mission statements is to instill in our students a, a love of learning and a, to instill in them uh, a, a goal to be lifelong learners. And in order to do that, they first have to be responsible for their own learning. And from what I've seen here again this afternoon, uh, your folks are well on your way. And congratulations. Those were just outstanding uh, presentations. And uh, again, thank you, uh, students, for being uh, wonderful ambassadors of the quality education that you can receive here at the Cliff College of Boston. So thanks. are staying for dinner. Let me confirm that it's ready to go. I'll give you the thumbs up here in a moment and we can have dinner. Thank you again. here this is before during I wasn't alive during that time but these times here are when I was alive um, I recall it as the richest part of Montana Anaconda and view today today in Anaconda there's four schools and according to the Census Bureau in 2013 Anaconda had about 9,000 today I'd say about it's getting down to 4,000 5,000 about especially in the town area because there's not as many jobs anymore and we're a big healthcare 
part of the state and close to Missoula and Bozeman. And then there's Butte. They have seven schools, about 5,000 enrolled in their schools. In my class, we were the smallest class to graduate from Anaconda High School. There used to be two high schools, uh, Central Anaconda High School and Anaconda High School, the public one. Butte still has a central one, and the class of mine was 69, and the last class to graduate with 100 was my oldest sister, who's 28, and she graduated with 112. Activities. Of course, Anaconda has more because Anaconda and Butte has a rivalry. Um, Anaconda, we have the Wayne Nessus basketball tournament. A lot of people all over the world come from everywhere. Even Dano, he played at it. I just found it a couple days ago. Um, <laughs> The Christmas drill, everyone comes to the streets, to the main streets, and enjoys themselves, drinks hot chocolate. High schooler students, they stand in the windows and act as dummies, and they have a contest of who could act as the best dummy and whatnot. Um, the Goose Town Softball Tournament. It's the biggest slow pitch softball tournament on the western side of the Mississippi. Everyone comes, and on Saturday night, we have a home run derby, and it's a lot of fun. Art in the Park, once again, all around the world people come to see this. Great art, great music, great food. Um, some of my favorite food is the huckleberry ice cream. The huckleberries are picked from Montana, hills and mountains. Live After Five, we have that on every Friday in the summertime. Once again, music, nice cars, great uh, food booths and whatnot. And the Polar Plunge, there's a mountain up in the uh, mountain lake and they go jump into the ice cold water, and then afterwards, they get in hot tubs. Butte, Evil Knievel days, those, that's a lot of fun. They watch motorcycle races, car races, whatnot. The Civil Center, Civil Civic Center, they have hockey games here, rodeos, fairs, concerts. St. Patrick's Day, I just put that up there because Butte and Anaconda reign from Irish descent, and St. Patrick's Day is a bigger day than New Year's Eve for us there. Montana Tech, that's their school there. They're the number one engineering school in the United States. And mining museums, there's a, I believe there's about five of them. And then Lady of the Rockies, there's this big huge statue of Mary of God, and she stands above view and shines down upon them. And the Berkeley Pit, which is the only place you can view toxic waste in the world, and you only have to pay $2 to get in to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Founders of Anaconda and Butte. So miners were looking for gold back in the days, and they came across Butte, Montana. The cattle farmers were coming, other miners were coming, and whatnot. And in 1860, they found this river flowing through the countryside and everything. And they decided to call it Silver Bow because when they were on top of the mountains, the rivers looked like silver. And so they thought, what the heck, this should be an omen, and they started mining there. And they did find a little silver, they found a little gold, but they were kind of striking out. They were starting, settlers were starting to move on. They didn't want to waste their time there, especially if they were going to be mined out. And then they started hitting the courts. That started bringing more people around. They started bringing mills, started building smokestacks and smelters, but they didn't know how to successfully build the smokestacks. So they kept on trying, kept on mining and shipping them to different countries and different parts of the states to get them mined. More and more copper started to show, and this is where people started to get excited. Electric electricity was just starting to build up, and at the time when, it, when electricity was getting really big and the copper was getting really big, Anaconda and Mon Montana, you had more electricity available in that area than Chicago and New York City at the time. People started to realize that it was a profit, and then Marcus Daly showed up to change everything. And this is Butte here, that's the M Hill, and that's the top of the hill that they saw there. Yeah. They were at the top of this hill, and then over here towards this was the rivers, and then over here are the mine areas, and starts of Butte. And then right here, that's where Tech is. Marcus Daly and the Copper Kings. He was born in Ireland and didn't come to New York City until 1856. He stayed there, he came around 12, like when he was 12, and he started to realize what he was interested in, and the city life wasn't for him. Then he started to go out towards California and Utah, and he realized he really liked the mining industry. 
and he got together with the Walker brothers. He shared some of his ideas with them, and they really liked him, and he knew what he was talking about. He just had great ideas and great plans of what to do. And then he was sent to Utah, and this is where he met his wife and married, and he had four kids. And then he was sent to Montana Territory because they needed a lot of help because they were getting hit so hard mining, and so many people were going there that needed help to understand how to mine. He went there and he bought the Alice mine. This was a smaller mine and he wanted to grow from that and he kept one fifth investment for himself then purchased the Anaconda claim. This was where I'm from in that area there. And with George Hurch, James Ben, Al, Ali Hagen, and Lloyd Tevis, they decided to get together and build the claim, build the town, and decided to build the Anaconda claim even bigger. George Hurst, he, our public library was named after him and James Ben Hagen, that's our tallest mountain, that was named after him. Silver mine at first, then they started to hit the copper very hard. Um, the copper vein about 300 feet deep and 100 feet wide. He got really excited about this and they had to start finding a place to smell. And they started to send all this copper to different places to smell, but it was just costing so much. So this is when he finally found the idea of building smelters himself. I believe he had four at first and then they built the biggest one. 17 million dollars worth of copper each year during this time. And then that's Marcus Daly there. This is his mansion in Hamilton, Montana. It's about an hour and a half from where I live and we had cross country races here every year. It's beautiful there in the fall. He had an outdoor swimming pool and outdoor tennis courts. 46 acres of land. He started a ranch cattle. Um, gardens. He also built play areas for his kids and whatnot. This is the hotel in my town. It's called the Marcus Daly Hotel. And they took about this much off right now. What's left is just this bottom part and that's where our subway was. But then the people who bought that building, they wanted subway to move out because they're going to build it up again. And they're going to have it about five stories high again. And then down there is where we have our life after five, and right there is where our subway was. Buttes Mines. It's known as the richest hill on earth, still is, and when people came to America and they didn't know where to start, if they didn't want to go to the meat packing places or other places, they didn't want to get involved in bad territory or whatnot, they said, don't stop here, don't stop to America, go straight to Butte. Butte was such a different part of, of Montana, such a different part of America, that they just had a culture of their own, especially the Irish and the Italians, the Dutch, some of German. In 1896, five square miles produced 210 million pounds of copper a year, and that's a lot. Um, 26 of the world supply, 51 of the U.S. supply. 1917, a huge disaster happened though. There was a 30-foot elevator shaft and it caught on flame and a hundred and 167 men were killed. And this is where ARCO came and OSHA came and they realized that they needed to do something different because even though they were mining so much of the world supply and the US supply, they couldn't um, sacrifice and risk men's lives anymore. And then Chile's Quaquicamata Qua mine heard of this, of Butte, and they decided to get a little pitch in of it. They started to buy this copper and distribute it all over the world. In World War II, they needed a lot of copper, and during this time, even women were starting to mine and working at the smelter because so many men had to go and help fight World War. Um, so during the time, this is by the pit watch, put in another way, the Berkeley Pit and Butte mines produced enough copper to pave the four lane highway four inches thick from Butte to Salt Lake City and three miles beyond. And then they started having a falling out with Chile's mines. They didn't want to buy it anymore. Other people were finding other mines to mine the copper from. And they could have easily built bigger smokestacks and bigger organizations to distribute the copper. This one is one mile to surface. If they didn't go any further than that because they were going wider than down further. They didn't want any more disasters or any more harm to come to the men. And I really like this picture because I think it would be really hard to get two wheels down underground and for them to pull back up. It, it's weird to think that they got those in the elevator and then lowered them down. <laughs> so those are pretty calm donkeys there. 
And then these are all the different levels of vines all the way down here. And this is about the mile mark here. All these red, those are the elevator chutes. I counted about 14. I'm not sure. I think half of those are still standing today. And in the winter, especially, they light them up with Christmas lights, and it's beautiful, especially at night. And then right there, that's the Berkeley pit. And it has different levels right there. And they started going up there. And then these are little organizations, kind of. And especially up there, that was its own town. They needed another town because so many people were coming. The Berkeley Pit. Several pits throughout the history of time. And the reason they started is, especially during World War II, they were getting, they had to get so much copper and so much of the ore out, they didn't know what to do with it. So they decided just to start building this big pit and just dumping it in there. They needed to put all the ore somewhere. It was mostly ore. Um, it's one mile on by a half a mile across, um, and it's over 1,780 deep in a hundred being acidic water with high concentrations of metal. Copper, iron, arsenic, zinc, cadmium, and more. They pump 13 million gallons a day, and what they do is they're doing that because they're still getting copper out of that water, and so they're getting about 400,000 pounds of copper a month. And right now, it's at a dangerous level. They're about at 3,000, I want to say 4,100. And if it gets about to 5,100, it's going to start overflowing and going into the beach wells. And it's rising a foot per month. So they're trying to think of something quick so it doesn't happen. Uh, another disaster. Here's the Berkeley pit here. There's <coughs> wells here here and over here and as you can see it's getting very dangerous to that over here this is where they just loaded up the ore and dumped it over they had to work quick and they needed to work efficiently so they just started dumping it there and then 1995 OSHA became and PETA became very um, suspicious because there was a flock of Canadian snow geese and they landed in there and there was a major snowstorm and then the next morning they were all dead they said that the Berkeley pit wasn't the harm of it and that they just got caught in, but there's suspicion that it was caused. The, all the acidic water and what's in it was what killed the snow geese. And this is the viewing deck that you can go to for the museum. Anaconda smokestack, this is where I reign. Um, I love the smokestack. In 1980, they wanted to tear it down. They thought it would be a disaster if something bad happened, but there was an organization that formed together to keep it up to signify what Anaconda went through and how much work they put through to just start a community here. It was completed in 1919, I believe in November, and it's 585 feet tall. To help, the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall, and 75 feet across at the bottom here, and then 60 at the top. And they have a state park where it's a simulation of what the top is, and you can draw. You can probably fit going across this way, I'd say, a lot of cars. And honestly, on the rim up here, you can drive your car around it because it's so thick. <laughs> And 1980 was shut down, like I said, and they wanted to keep it up. But a mile around, you cannot go in this area here because the ground is so acidic and so bad for you, you have to wear a mask. And a lot of the people now, like a lot of people's great-grandparents, grandparents, um, they die because they had so much junk and so much acidic stuff in their lungs. And here's how tall it was there. Um, my older friend, my older brother's friend, he, he kind of snuck up there and started climbing it, but then they realized that it wasn't going to be a good idea, so they left. <laughs> and then here's a car there to show you how tall it is. And this is our, our golf course here, and this is the um, one of the shoots for the smokestacks. They have four of them, but they were just too small and they were not helping at all, so they wrecked them down and built this huge one. Um, this is another picture of when how the mine looked then and just how it was in the mines. It was very dangerous. There, it was kind of funny because during these times, one of the reasons the Butte and Anaconda have such a uh, competitive stand between each other is because these, these people, exactly the miners between the smelter workers, they wanted to know who was tough enough, the miners or the smelter workers. Um, there was actually one time where a bus was tipped, there was a riot because 
at a basketball tournament, there was so much confusion and so much competitiveness of who was better, Butte or Anaconda. And one team, the Butte team, at an Anaconda match, I forget what year it was, but it was a long time ago, they were actually escorted out because the Anacondas could not stand everyone. People were spitting and throwing stuff on them, and it's just a huge, huge um, competitive front. And then over here, this is how they got the copper out. They smelted it, and what, what they did is they have slag in the end, and they heat it up so much that the ore, the ore comes out and the rest of it starts crystallizing. In Helena they have one, but the slag are big blocks, and they heated it up so much that this started to turn to sand, so I'll pass that around. And then that's what this is, is the slate pile. I drive, when I go into town, I drive on this the whole, the whole time. Um, and people want to get rid of it because it's, there's kids who's been on it, it causes danger. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that it's ugly. Honestly, I really like it. <laughs> that's just my opinion. I think it symbolizes who, what Anaconda was and is. Uh, and you, they're starting to figure out ways to use this slate to use for glass. And we also use it on our golf course for some of the sand pits and some of the traps. And then all this area, once it was first started, it was filled with pine trees and trees and everything. And, but they all were cut down. And this is where Anaconda comes into the big burn. So that's where it kind of drove me is because they wanted all these trees and they wanted to go all the way up here and whatnot to cut down those trees to run the small stack. This is our golf course here. As you can see, those are the sand traps and sand pits. And this is the town right there. The smoke stack is over here. This is the big, I forget what they call them, but the bowls that they put the molten copper in and then they dumped it to make the wire and whatnot. And this is the slate pile that I drive by every day. I forget how many tons there is, but there's so much. And there's even some more up towards this area. They just produced too much and they didn't know what to do with it. So they're trying to get rid of it and trying to sell it to places to turn into glass and different types of decorations. And then here comes the 1908 flood. One of the reasons the ground is so acidic is because in 19, I believe, uh, 1907, 1908, it was one of the largest rain seasons ever. In June 6th, seven inches of rain, The next, and then the next day it started to snow. The river was about eight feet, but then over a couple of weeks it went up to 17 feet. And then it broke the dam, and all this stuff, it went to the Berkeley pit, it went everywhere, all into the pits, all over to the mines, took all the ore and swept it all the way over to Anaconda. And so, that's why all this is plain right there. There's no trees. They're trying to rebuild it. Arco and OSHA are really trying to um, clean up the area. We've been on a, I've been on a lot of field trips where we go and see what the streams are looking like now. A lot of the life is coming back to it. A lot of the animals and a lot of the bug life are coming back to the streams and whatnot. And a lot of, as you can see here, birds and animals are seen there. You see a lot of deer there now, but early back in the old days, you did not see any because the ground was so bad. And they're dumping it over to Warm Springs Ponds, and they're trying to distill it and trying to get rid of it as fast as possible, but they have nowhere to put it. And then here's my hometown right here. This is the Marcus Daily Hotel, where it stands. This used to be Subway. That's our one stoplight of traffic. <laughs> um, that's the Sea Hill. Right there in the fall, the sea hill um, symbolizes Central Anaconda High School, and we have a tradition that on the last days that we are seniors, we go up and light them. And it used to be that the juniors went up and light lit the sea hill kind of as a battle, but now the juniors come up and we battle with paintball guns and whatnot. And so that's when Central. I have a friend. Um, he's he. He's a neighbor of ours. He went to Central Anaconda, and it was big. But after people started leaving because the smell just shut down, they couldn't keep the town open, so they just left. It was pretty much once you graduated uh, high school, the girls went to college, the guys went to the smelter of the mines. And then this is our Washoe Theater. It's one of the 10 top theaters in the country. It still stands, I believe. 1936 was when it's built. Here's a 
shirt that I got, it glows in the dark, so you can wear it when you go to the movie. <laughs> Uh, it was built in 1936. The 75th anniversary was um, when it was in running was about 2011. Uh, they show great movies. They now just have it put in 3D and a surround sound system. The tickets, I would have to say, it's about $7.50 for a 3D movie, $6 for a regular movie. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy and it's beautiful. The, I believe it sits about 500. I mean, it fits all the schools and probably some of Buttes too, when we have big movies and everything, we get out for the day. Um, it's really cool, they just redid the lights a couple years ago, so it looks really nice. And in the back, you can see all the posters he's kept through the years. And then here's the A-Hill. Uh, we climbed that and then lit it. We put a 14 right there and lit it for the night. It was really cool, we just put flares in. This is the M-Hill over at Butte, and they have a big, huge 4th of July show. And then this is the smokestack from my house's view. And then references, and then picture resources. This one at the bottom, the pit watch, if you want to learn any more about uh, the pit or the Berkeley pit, what the mines are up to now, I very recommend that site. I learned a lot from that site, a lot that I didn't know about the Berkeley pit. I've honestly never been to the museum, but I've seen it before. And I tried to get some pit water, but it was, you have to be, pretty high up top to get that stuff, so they just don't let the college students run and get it, so. Um, any questions? No? Okay. Which is better, Anaconda or Butte? Oh, Anaconda with <laughs> Yes. Is there any special monument or recognition for Evil Knievel in Butte? Yes, there actually is. Um, I forget when he died, but his son comes back every year for us, too. It's a huge weekend. Honestly, in the summer of Anaconda and Butte, every single weekend's booked. I work at um, a resort. It's called Fairmont Hot Springs Resort. It's a natural hot springs, and tourists from all over come. And, and, and during the summer, it's very busy. You find people from France, from Italy, all coming to Evil from Evil Days, coming for art in the park, coming for all this stuff. So even though it's small, it's starting to become the tourist house that everyone thought it was going to be. Oh. And then I'll go look if any of you want to look at it, and then some more pictures from my high school yearbook also. Thank you. All right, before I turn it over to Dr. Gross for closing remarks, I just wanted to say that I love Symposium Day, and I think if this is your first time here, you know why. Now it's obvious we've got really, really smart, really talented students here with very varied interests. So thank you to the students who did the extra work um, and did the work to be in the honors program. Thank you to the instructors who taught the courses and who helped the students to choose projects. We certainly appreciate it and I think it's just a great experience here for our students. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gross. Thanks, uh, Carrie and uh, Haley and uh, Amanda and, and Jesse and Sheena and Sarah. That's great work. Thank you very much. Thanks for your effort and all your hard work. And also uh, to Ken and, and uh, Alma and uh, Steve and Lexi, thank you for helping these students and for mentoring them and, and for the extra effort that you put in uh, for this, uh, what we call a value-added honors program. And, and Gary, thanks for coordinating it all and getting it all together. Uh, our uh, goal is to make this program grow, and with the collaboration that I've seen between the instructors and, and the students uh, this afternoon, we're well, well on our way. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. One of our uh, mission statements is to instill in our students a, a love of learning and a, to instill in them uh, a, uh, a goal to be lifelong learners. And, in order to do that, they first have to be responsible for their own learning. And from what I've seen here again this afternoon, uh, your folks are well on your way. And congratulations, those were just outstanding uh, presentations. And uh, 
again, thank you, uh, students, for being uh, wonderful ambassadors of the quality education that we can receive here at the Florida College of Boston. So thanks. are staying for dinner. Let me confirm that it's ready to go. I'll give you the thumbs up here in a moment and we can have dinner. Thank you again.